All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the next installment of Game RT's webinar series. I am Jen Bartlett, a board member uh, for the Game RT Roundtable uh, for ALA. I'm a, the head of reference and adult services here at the Manchester Public Library. I always have to clarify that because there's a half a million Manchesters across the country, and I'm here in Connecticut, so I'm close to some of you folks in the chat. Um, I'm, we're kind of suburbs of Hartford. We're, near, we're in Yukon country out here. Um, I'm here today to be your host, to some Q&A, and give general support to a friend and colleague here. This event is being recorded. The recording will be available to Game RT members for six months before becoming publicly available on the Game RT website. We're also live streaming this session on Twitch. And to hello to our Twitch viewers. Twitch video on demand will be accessible after the six month members only period. If you aren't following Game on RT on Twitch already, please give us a follow so we can build up that channel. The link will be in the chat soon. For anyone not previously familiar with Game RT, we are the Games and Gaming Roundtable of the American Library Association. Our mission is to promote gaming in libraries, whether it's programming, collection development, community building, prototyping, playtesting, or research. GameRT has two professional development series, a webinar series, and a learn to play series. These events usually alternate each month. This month, we have today's webinar on building an RPG library collection, and soon we'll meet the presenter for that topic. And first, I want to let you know about some of our upcoming events. Next slide, please, Mary, um, that are coming up. So we have a bunch of different things. I'll throw all of these links in the chat, and then you can kind of toodle along, click and see. Um, but most exciting, of course, always is International Games Month coming up in November. Um, so uh, also exciting news, we're going to be streaming some live plays on the Twitch channel starting in September. Our Twitch team is developing a streaming schedule, so keep an eye on GameRT spaces for date announcements, potential player recruitment, and other fit Twitch news. And anyone looking for information on running RPGs in libraries can join the GameRT RPG Guild, that's new this year, to get experience playing and running RPGs. Also throw that linkaroo in the chat um, that goes to the Discord server in a moment. Um, so now we'll get on with today's presentation. It'll be a Q&A session at the end. Questions asked in the chat during the presentation can potentially missed. I'll try my best folks um, to catch them if I see them. I'll monitor Twitch chat for questions as well. Um, if you want to ask questions during this presentation, please use the Zoom Q&A feature to submit questions. And now, welcome um, my friend, Connecticut colleague, Mary Richardson. Woo! Mary is the Teen Services Librarian at the Simsbury Public Library here in Connecticut, where she has, and I quote, the best job ever. Um, she is an avid reader of graphic novels, sapphic romance novels, and the occasional thriller. Mary enjoys sharing her love of gaming, comics, and all things geeky. She believes the library is the place to share all of those things in a safe, inclusive space. Preach. Thank you for joining us today, Mary, and we'll hand things over to you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and I definitely learned some things that I want to sign up for too with our roundtable uh, that I was not aware of, so awesome. All right. Let's get to it. So we're going to talk about building an RPG library, and a lot of this is based on my experiences um, at my current job and my last job, too. Uh, I went from a very small library to a much larger library, which has a little bit better funding. Um, and also, I am a nerd that goes to a game con every year, usually, so I've been able to kind of like have a lot of friends that have a good network for this kind of stuff and meet a lot of people in the gaming industry. I don't go to Gen Con. I do like PAX Unplugged, PAX East, that kind of stuff. Um, Gen Con's cool. It's just like, I don't want to fly out there. Um, cool. So I'm just taking this from like the bare bones foundation. So like, what is an RPG? So RPG is short for a role-playing game. So this is a game that runs a storyline and players and a game master use dice to resolve conflicts and actions. And that can be everything from yes, combat, but also like investigating insight checks to see if someone's lying, charisma checks to see if somebody can be like more charismatic and convince people of their, of their lies. Well, I guess that should be, anyway. So we can get to the weeds of that later. 
so most people know about role-playing games because Stranger Things has really put this into our pop culture. Um, anybody that works with youth right now probably has kids that are coming in like asking for RPGs or asking for D&D um, or signing up for your programs um, or just like talking about it. Um, I had another kid, I had a kid wearing actually the Hellfire Club shirt to our beginning D D game yesterday. Like he was so excited. Um, so D D, so Stranger Things has really kind of brought it into our pop culture, but also I think that Wizards of the Coast, the publisher that makes D D, uh, created more accessible rule sets. So it's also just easier to pick up than it used to be. Um, so from my perspective, why should you create an RPG library in your library? Uh, well, like I said, D&D is really popular and we often program around those like hype things. Um, I don't know how many times like, you know, you've seen something and you've grabbed it for a book display um, or like a meme or you've like created programming around something because you found out that your patrons, um, your community members were talking about it. And so it fills that need. Um, so if you already have an established board game collection, it's kind of like a natural extension to just go ahead and start building an RPG library off of that. Um, and you can even do things like create some of the D&D &D, uh, like starter sets that are boxes. You can even put those in your board games to kind of just like funnel it on out. Um, and like I said, it does create even more gaming program. And that's what I always wanna see is I always wanna see more games in libraries. I want people coming to our spaces to know that we are more than just books um, and a place to print things like your Amazon return label. Um, Cool. So D&D is the most popular RPG, uh, but there's also a lot of others. So Pathfinder is the other really big role playing game that's kind of similar to D&D and that we have this like medieval fantasy world with like dragons and all kinds of like monsters and mythical creatures. Uh, Pathfinder also has a science fiction space one called Starfinder. Um, there's kids on bikes, which is also just like a very light RPG. So the rule set is very easy to uh, comprehend and it doesn't have like a giant like um, like, you know, 100 page book telling you how to play it. Um, and it's very much like Stranger Things too. It is kids on bikes that like mysterious monstrous things happen to them. Um, there's Fake Core, uh, which has a completely different dice rolling system. It's plus or minuses on the dice. Uh, there's Fiasco, which is a, a role playing game that's a party game, uh, which is super, super fun because we're all playing together. We're rolling a bunch of dice and saying, yes, the scene goes forward. The scene doesn't go forward. Um, and there's everything from like, you're on a plane that's crashing to you're doing a bank heist to you're at the 1970s in a disco tech world. Um, Call of Cthulhu is if you want more Eldritch Horror. It's a horror game, but it also has a lot more investigation uh, type things into it. So it's more like mystery solving. Um, Hero Kids is a super basic uh, superhero RPG for the younger set. Uh, Mouse Guard is another one based off the, the famous, or not famous, but the popular uh, comic. Uh, they created the RPG for it and it's been very successful. Uh, Business Wizards is one that maybe, maybe most people probably don't know about. Uh, Ninth Level Games is a board game company and they also do RPGs. Um, they have created their own uh, rule system that's different from the D&D 5e. Um, it's called Polymorph and Business Wizards is you are a bunch of wizards and you are trying to actually run a business. So imagine like office management, but yet spells keep exploding. Um, there's also one page RPGs and there's so many more. And these are just like most of the stuff I'm gonna talk about today are print resources you can keep in your library because we're looking at like getting things circulating. Um, there's so many RPGs that are also um, exist uh, Digitally, uh, in digitally only, uh, and they actually have not like been printed for like circulation. Um, because it's way cheaper to have a PDF hosted on a site that people pay for than it is to actually get things in print. Um, cool. So RPGs and D&D is so popular right now that we have corporations getting in on it. So a couple of years ago, Wendy's, the fast food restaurant, actually made the Feast of Legends. Uh, they created a whole entire RPG based on like their whole hamburger line. And it was very crazy and wild and like very silly. Uh, you could actually play it. Like I had some of the kids at my old library like downloaded it and we're just like, yeah, we're gonna play it on our own. And I was like, have fun, my, my dudes. D&D um, &D actually partnered with Nerds Candy. So like the more, this was such a, this is like the ultimate of capitalism. Um, you tried to buy the different boxes and it unlocked different parts of the adventure for you to play. Um, so that was another weird one that came out. Um, so that's kind of the baseline. Here's a bunch of stuff that I've talked about. Where do you start? 
Um, so I really just started with D&D core books. Uh, so we have like the player's manual, the dungeon master's guide and the monster manual. And I have several copies of those. I have three copies of each uh, because the more programming we've done around it, uh, the more it keeps circulating. We're also in a consortium of like 30 odd other libraries. And so sometimes when you create like niche little collections like this, everybody else in the consortia also wants to be part of it. And so they'll start like, pulling it out or ILLing it from your library, which is what's happening. Um, there's, along with the core set, there's also Monsters of the Multiverse and Xander's Guide to Everything and Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And these are kind of like the extended core books. So like Player's Manual tells you everything you need to know to create a character. DM's Guide tells you everything you need to know to like create your own campaign to run. Monster Manual just has basically a compendium of monsters. Um, and so Monsters of the Multiverse, Xander's Guide, and Tasha's of College of Everything has a little bit of all three of those in. So you get like more classes, you get more races, you get more um, monsters to play with um, in more also setups, um, sort of in the more lore. And that's the thing is like, once you have a kid that hooks into it, like I've listen to ad nauseum to lore because they get super into it and they also start creating their own lore with it and it's like really exciting um so we've got about three copies of each on the shelf I actually just included this summer because we we're running D, D for the first time and well not for the first time but the first beginner summer here um i created a uh library use only copies because what I was finding is, is a lot of kids were checking out like our players manuals and then we didn't have the on hand. And now everything in the core books is available online for free, but it's sometimes you just want the book because you just need to look up a rule really quickly. I personally use Google all the time, but the kids like to pass the book around. Um, so we have a library use only copies for those. Um, the next part after you have like your, your rule sets, you have your modules. So these are actual um, games that Wizards of the Coast have created. So it's basically like a blueprint for how to run the adventure, a backstory, what your adventurers are gonna accomplish, and then whatever happens. So um, a couple examples of this, like I'm currently, our year long campaign that I run is called Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Um, and so we had to put that on hold for the summer, but I've had kids really like, restarting. Um, and it's basically a, a giant heist uh, story in like this like fantasy medieval town. Um, and like things are going to go very, very badly because there's warring factions, there's political intrigue, uh, there's a haunted tavern that my players just like inherited. Uh, so it's a lot of cool stuff. Uh, Candle Keep Mysteries I've also used before. It's basically little adventures. So like one shots that you can run. Um, I find that they actually are not one shots, but more like two or three shots because they, they take more than like two hours to play. Um, Ghost of the Salt Marsh is like the pirate one. Um, so it's basically a, a, an adventure that takes place out on the seas. Um, Spelljammer is actually just about to come out. It drops this month. Uh, it's basically d, d in space. Um, and I'm just kind of highlighting you to show you like just the breadth of like what Wizards of the Coast is putting out in the D&D &D world. So you've got everything from like heist, weird library mysteries, pirates to space. Like it's the sky is the limit. And um, what I found too is sometimes our patrons, they'll check stuff out and they'll use things and then like or they'll use the whole campaign. So it's kind of cool because you can pick and choose. And so you kind of think about that when you're creating your um, RPG library is like how, and see if you can figure out like how they're actually intentionally using your collection because that will also drive where it goes, which I'm about to talk about in a minute. Um, so how to find some of the other RPGs. So uh, obviously ALA and Game Roundtable RPG resource guide is super great. I've used it before in the past. Um, also their Facebook group is great too, because then, and, um, or the Discord and or anything, basically anywhere you can ask questions and see what other people are doing in their libraries and find out like, hey, which adventures are like working for you. Um, also, if you have a local game store, try and do a partnership with them. Sometimes you can get like a good discount with them. Um, and then one of the things I also use, this is one of my new ideas that I have yet to actually put into practice, but we're getting closer to that. Uh, Grant Howitt has one page RPGs on his website and um, there will be a resource list that you will be getting that has all this information in it. Um, and they're like, if you've ever heard of Honey Heist or, uh, oh gosh, what's the other one with the raccoons and the erasing, it's the Fast and Furious. Is it Trash Pandas? No, that's not right. That's a game right game. Anyway, um, they're like th these weird, crazy little setups that you can play them in like a couple hours. Um, and like his are like download, pay what you want. Um, and so I'd actually like donated like a bunch of money and just downloaded a bunch personally. <laughs> uh, 
but you can, I was going to create a binder with like a brief record in our catalog. So that way it'll just like sit on the shelf and you can like check it out and pick up a one page RPG. And I want to actually start running some of these for like November's International Games Month. Um, Cause I'm trying to kind of diversify the idea that role-playing games are more than just Dungeons and Dragons. Um, Okay, so some of my other resources, um, I had given this talk before and Jen had asked me some really good questions about like, where do I want to go with this? And it really kind of pushed me to start thinking like, what am I doing? And like, what do, what do the teens that are mostly using my collection um, looking for? I have a fair amount of kids who are running their own uh, d and uh, games. And so things that they really were looking for um, were, oh, I just need like a book of random encounters, or I need a book of like random magical items or like whatever. Um, and they can look online and stuff. Um, so the random, the game master's book of is actually a series. So there's NPCs. So non-player characters, which you often need in role-playing games, um, to kind of like fill out your storyline or give your quest or interact with your players. Um, random encounters. There's another one for puzzles and traps in dungeons. Um, and there's a fourth one that I can't remember off the top of my head. That series I've just added this summer and I'm seeing them circulate pretty well because the kids that are running the games are like, yes. Because um, there are tables and stuff that are out there on the internet, but like you could find a poorly done spreadsheet on Reddit or you could sometimes it's just easier to have the book. Um, so another one that I just added, um, and I'm still, I have to kind of like talk this one up a little bit. Rolled and Told is actually a, like a comic book magazine type situation that comes out monthly. And it's a little comic. And then the comic is actually an RPG adventure. Um, they have two volumes where they have actually created their, um, they've taken everything and bound it and published it. Um, and pretty much everything that I've talked about here, that's a hard copy, I've been able to either get through our Baker and Taylor vendor, or we've ordered it through our Barnes and Noble or our Amazon account. Um, and then I also just added um, how to draw fantasy art and RPG maps, again, for our kids that are doing, or any of our adults that are um, doing like dungeon master stuff, um, just because, I have a lot of people that are telling me about their homebrews and stuff, and I really want to be able to figure out, like, how can I support that? Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I've got. That's, like, the bare bones of it, and we're growing it, like, every day. Um, so, yeah, so I am open for questions if we have any. As I unmute myself over here. Excellent. We did have a question uh, from Twitch. Is it still a problem for game collections with players writing in the books? I'll start. It's a multi question thing. So I'll ask that first. Writing in the books. Has that been a problem for you, Mary? I have not had that as a problem. Um, I think the thing that sometimes is a problem is like when you buy a D&D book for Wizards of the Coast, it has a map in the back and we had to start doing like a map attachment, which isn't too off the beaten path because some of our nonfiction books have those too. Um, and sometimes those go missing, but that's not like, that's not the end of the world. It doesn't like kill the circulation for me. Um, my main problem is just like getting the books back. Cause I mean, I've been guilty of this too, of like checking out a D&D book for a long time period of time that's probably too long because we are fine free and I am running a campaign for my friends um, separately from the library. Um, and I just wanted the resource book. I should probably just buy the book at this point. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, we're also filling a need um, in our community and also in our consortia because people, I'm always like, when people ask me um, in Connecticut, like, oh, should I get d and I'm like, yes, get more modules because like I am, I am facilitating all of this for the state. Like, please, please help me out. Like, you all buy Batman comics. Let's all buy D&D. &D. <laughs> uh, second question from the same person. Do gaming copies wear faster than the rest of your collection? I haven't found that to be true. Um, so, so far, they're holding up pretty well. Uh, although I will say I just added some newer stuff. Uh, one of the problems that I do foresee is that not every RPG book is a standard size. So like wizards are pretty much always the same, but I've been ordering like the really silly ones from ninth level because I also ordered the excellence, which is a, a whole RPG about being the best princess ever. Like, why would you not do that? Yeah, <laughs> um, but the, the ninth level games, they're super good, but they're this big. 
So they have to constantly make sure they're on the shelf and they're getting displayed properly because they can kind of get sucked into the shelf. Um, and anybody that has a graphic novel collection has also experienced this where like you have your standard like Marvel DC sizes and then like all the other ones are like all over the place. They're either too big treasury comics or they're too small. Um, so I do have that issue. Uh, so I'm always trying to kind of make sure. And it's um, I know it's getting used all the time because almost like every other day I will check my shelves in the morning, kind of straighten up my teen room and they're all out of order. Cause I'm like, y'all, the new books go in the front. Like, wow. Okay. This got hit. So, um, that is so far been my experience. It hasn't been too bad. Uh, I do foresee if our paperbacks get really, get really popular and those probably will have to be replaced at some point. Okay. Um, last question from the same person. Do you have a special policy for replacing copies? Not really. Um, I have a, I'm fortunate that I have a pretty good budget. Um, I, I, so last year, um, this is such a cheat. Um, my budget was a lot smaller coming into it because this position was kind of empty during the pandemic. Um, and so no one was really advocating for like teen spending. Uh, so I didn't have enough. And that's, that is my problem. Like Wizards of the Coast books are expensive, right? We do get a pretty good discount through our book vendor, uh, but it's still a $25 book as compared to like a $10 YA book. Um, so that is, it is, it's costly. Um, I actually had a pretty decent programming budget though. And so I was buying all of my D&D books and saying they were like programming materials because technically they are because I use them all the time. And the kids will pull random books for random things when they're building new characters um, in my campaigns or if they die and have to create a new one. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with that. And then I've also some of my stuff, which is pretty similar if y'all are in, if you have board game collections and you're buying directly from vendors, um, I have set up a vendor thing with ninth level so that I can get from them. And I'm thinking about reaching out to a couple other game companies that also do RPGs um, to try and have like, cause they'll just invoice me. It just makes my life easier as a librarian. Cool. Um, Question from Molly, do you have any advice for implementing this in a smaller library? I'm in a one library system in a rural area. Yeah, so when I started this, I was in a smaller, uh, Jen can tell you, I was in a smaller library in a rural area in Connecticut. Um, we did the core rule books for D&D and we just bought a couple modules. Um, and then I also did Pathfinder there too, because I, I had, I'd heard from some of the adults they wanted Pathfinder. Um, and so we just kind of stayed really small and, um, and just kind of tried to kind of basically meet our community needs. Uh, and then we ended up having to add more books over time. Um, and fortunately our library director like supported this because she saw the benefit of the program. Um, so we were able to grow it. So I did start very modest and very small there. I went bigger here because I know I have like the population and budget size to kind of like push it a little bit more, if that makes any sense. Cool. Question from Tom, who is asking about the Star Wars RPGs. Any experience with those or um, uh, I have in articulation? Uh, I haven't. I've started looking at them, but I also was talking to one of my coworkers who runs a D and D at a different library, and we were having like an RPG jam session. And she was telling me that the problem with the Star Wars RPGs is like the the rule set wasn't great. But I haven't looked into it. But there's also a ton of people that have done parody versions of that. So like I have the Rebel Scum version from Ninth Level, um, and there's a couple of other ones that are set up kind of like that. Um, so I don't really have a great answer for that question. But if you do know that you have a lot of Star Wars fans that want to give it a shot, what's, you know, and you got that, you have the funds for it, throw in a couple books and see what happens. Yeah. Um, from Danielle, have you had any problems with challenges with the content of your TTRPG books? <laughs> no, I don't think the parents that uh, got upset about genderqueer being on our shelf realized that we have role-playing games. <laughs> Um, we did have a book challenge earlier this year, but it was for genderqueer, which is not really, it's not special because like so many of us had challenges across the country for genderqueer um, and it didn't, it didn't go anywhere. Uh, but yeah, no one has, has really realized it. Um, most of the time I have parents that are excited that their kid has access to these books because they watch Stranger Things and they want to play and they, they have a place to actually do it. And we also, I'm fortunate that our, our middle school has an after school D&D club that I work with a little bit too, to try and like keep the pipeline going. Hmm. I will tangentially say that I was on the desk one day and one grandmother was in with her grandchildren and the 
one of the granddaughters said, oh, can we check out D&D? And the grandmother was like, no, it's satanic. And I was like, that still exists? Like, come on. But I know. People. I'm kind of, I, I hate to say it, but like the, some of the framing we've had, I'm kind of wondering if like they'll pick up the D&D books and like we'll have satanic panic version two, electric boogaloo. Um, who knows? I hope not. Oh. I hope not. All right. Um, do you question from Ernest? Er, Ernest? I'm sorry if I'm saying your first name incorrectly. Uh, do you have a maximum player number of players per session? And how do you handle registration? Uh, yeah, so we do registration through our calendar. Um, I will always have one kid that randomly shows up and was like, hey, I came to play. And I'm just like, do you have a character sheet? And they're like, what's a character sheet? I'm like, great. Uh, so here's a pre-made one. <laughs> uh, I usually try and keep my, I started with my game here at six, um, but really I have up to eight that can play. Um, and I will say, if you're starting out with a D&D group, the more, the larger the group, the harder it is you're going to have controlling it. Um, especially if you have like newer players that are very, um, like one of the things I've learned is, um, trying to explain that D, D is not a video game so i don't do experience points i do uh milestones so like you level up when you've created a certain when you've hit a certain part in the story arc uh because i learned that the kids will treat it like a video game and grind and then cause problems and try and kill everything and everyone um middle schoolers man um and so i don't do that because my whole point is we're playing a cooperative storytelling game together. So I ask a lot of questions like, how do you, how do you think your character feels about what just happened? Like, what do you, okay, so like this character just said this to you, like other player character, like and they're looking at me like, I don't like that. I'm like, we'll tell them why you don't like that <laughs> in your character. And they're like, what? And that's, that's the hard part is getting them. Cause they'll be like, can I, can I? I'm like, you gotta stop asking me and start doing. Mm -hmm. I was like, you live your life. You're living your fantasy life now. Um, so I also don't allow any evil alignments because that is bad. So it's probably more than you asked, but that kind of all plays into it. Um, I have managed up to 12 people in a game. I do not recommend that. It's just, I did not have the time at my old library to run two sessions. And if I did, all of them would just sign up because they were like, yeah, we get to play twice a week. And I'm like, no. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, so like my, we, we kept our, our, our beginner games for the summer to, to like six to eight. Okay. Um, further questions. Do you circulate RPG kits that include rule books with dice and printed sheets? No, I don't. And I'm actually thinking about doing that because um, it's pretty easy to do because you can get like the D&D &D essential kits mm -hmm. um, or you can even build your own kits with other RPG stories that you like. Um, so I've been thinking about buying the Stranger Things kit, uh, which is kind of okay. Um, but people will check it out because it's Stranger Things. Um, and then there's also an Essentials kit. And um, I think there's a newer one that replaced Minds of Fandelver, which has like the pre-made characters and stuff like that. And I was actually, when I was driving to work, I was thinking about like, oh yeah, I can just order those because I'm going to get this question about this. Uh, I could order those. I could throw more dice in the box. We can laminate the, the player. I was already like thinking like, how do we do this? <laughs> um, to, and we already have like a circulating board game collection too at this library. So like, why not? And I actually, um, we have someone in the community that either play tests or just game reviews, and he will occasionally just dump a bunch of like board games on us. And he gave us a bunch of RPG games. And I was pretty excited because we got the new um, Shadowrunner box set with that. And I was already thinking like, how do I circulate this? So, I mean, you totally should try it because it probably will go out. Yeah, the side question of, of that was, how would you recommend going about creating kits um so we have some scenarios where we have like plastic see-through boxes for certain things in our library of things because our library of things is board games to puzzles to um chromebooks telescope knitting needles you name it we probably got it yeah uh we've got we've got long games now too um so i'm pretty excited that we've branched out a couple different Actually, it's not my project, it's somebody else's. And I'm, I'm very psyched to see what they've done with it. I've just added it to the board game collection because I have experience with that. Um, 
I think you could probably just get like some plastic bags that have like the lock, or not plastic bags, plastic boxes that have the locking lids um, and then create blank sheets. Uh, if you don't want to constantly have to replace the blank sheets, laminate them and include um, white markers uh, or wiper markers. That's one of the things I've loved about this recent thing in board games within the past five years is that we're seeing board games with whiteboard markers. Like, I love that. Like such a... I, small, simple, easy hack that just makes it easy so that you don't have to like get more paper that you're gonna lose. Um, but you can easily do that with your RPGs uh, too, with your, your, your character sheets. Um, and then like you, dice is super cheap on Amazon. Um, you can buy dice sets, which is what I did. Um, or you can even buy from Chessex, you can get 20, like you can get like a couple pounds of dice for like 20 bucks. Um, so if you lose it, it's not the end of the world. Um, and that's one of the things I always want to stress is like, if you lose something, it's not the end of the world. It's the library. We'll just replace it. It's fine. Um, but yeah, so I think you could easily create like kits with that with like little, little games. Um, so that is how I would do it. That's how I'm thinking about doing it. Yeah. Not there yet. You kind of just answered this question already. Have you circulated any of the D&D room quest Cthulhu type starter boxes? And I think you answered that question. Yeah, not yet. As again, I've only been at this library job for like a year. So I kind of hit the ground running. I started right before summer reading last year. <laughs> so I've still been trying to kind of get my bearings and figure out like what the community wants and needs. Um, question from Twitch from Scott, I'm thinking. Does anyone or, or you, Mary, um, allow teens and adults to mix in their gaming programs or do you keep them separate? I've, I've tried to keep them separate so far just because I really want the teens to have a sense of independence. Um, I also uh, am a big fan of inclusive gaming and being a woman in gaming, I've had some not inclusive experiences <laughs> throughout game cons or just even like being a woman or, you know, I remember being like 13 and going to my comic shop and getting like shamed for wanting the book that I wanted because uh, it wasn't this book. And I'm just like, I have no, I have no space for that. Um, and so I'm very, I do not think everyone's like this, but the last thing I need is for like an adult who's been playing for years to come in and gatekeep on a kid that's trying to figure out how to play. Um, because I try and keep a very um, open community when we play that the kids watch me fail sometimes as a game master and that's okay. I was like, you know, y'all, I'm not, I was like, y'all, it's not D and D or RPGs until we're all arguing about how the spell works that no one ever uses that you're using in this one time that you just remember that you have, um, or we have to figure out this condition. Um, and like, I'm like, oh, sometimes I'm like, how does that work? Uh, and so like, one of the things like what always cracks me up is that I always forget on ability checks where things are. And I have a post-it on the inside of my dungeon master screen. And occasionally a kid will be like, wait, how do you not remember that perception is such and such? I was like, well, no perception, but it's the intelligence and wisdom, my brain never gets them straight that's what the cheat sheet's for you're not supposed to get out of get away from my screen um so that's kind of how like it's I, I don't want them to i would like to i'm kind of curious to see if we could have some intergenerational one-shot stuff um but right now um the teens are the ones that are really asking for D, &D at our library it's not really the adults but i'm curious to see moving forward in the next couple of years as we expand our gaming program um more and more, will that happen? So we'll find out. Um, a question from Molly. Uh, she asks, I am in an academic library at a community college. Any advice on how to market an RPG collection to our collection development person? Who? I don't know. Uh, see, the public libraries were all about our statistics, right? And I think academic, you're still about your stats, but you care about your circulation as much with that. Um, but I'm assuming you probably have a leisure collection because most academic libraries do. I remember my time working in academic before I transitioned to, to public. Um, I think you kind of have to look at it with anything that you're probably going to solve. A, you're going you're gonna to serve a, um, a community need. Um, and I bet you probably could, if you had to do a survey and um, figure out what they're looking for and what they want. Um, it really is for me, it's been a field of dreams things. I built it, they show up, they come for it. Um, like we actually have a kid that came from another town for my D&D &D club because he was like, oh, we don't have one in West Hartford. I was like, well, you do, but it's full. And he was like, we do? I was like, you, you do, here's the information. <laughs> um, so and we've had kids from other towns because like it's just there's there's a need for it. 
Um, so I think it would actually be an easy sell if you go for like the community driven aspect of it, and especially if you can find some students that you know want to play in the library and you can help like facilitate that. Um, I think that also would be a way to go with that too, because you could totally create like some some student programming around that very, very easily, or be like, oh, hey, come have a stress relief uh, time during like midterms and like play a one shot D&D &D and just like chill. I mean, there's so many places that are doing board gaming in academic libraries. Um, why not the occasional like one shot or RPG campaign or like, hey, we have the tools for you. Mm -hmm. uh... Uh, question from Bryn. When you plan the program, do you schedule it as just recurring or do you have predetermined number of sessions? Um, I schedule it as recurring because I never know how far my players are going to get um, because sometimes they're very um, goal oriented. Uh, and then sometimes we have the, I'm just going to go follow this duck for a while and see what happens. Um, for example, in the ongoing Waterdeep game, they uh, inherited this tavern uh, and it was haunted. So they had to figure out how to make peace with the poltergeist. And then now they've been trying to figure out how to like fix it up and like make nice with all the guilds in Waterdeep uh, and then also like hire people. And they actually even went so far, these are high school kids, created a fantasy menu um, that they sent me uh, with like a whole font series and everything with this. <laughs> um, so they, and they have a group chat that I never get to see because they don't want me to know what they're plotting, which is fine because I don't need to know what they're plotting. Um, and then that's, and sometimes they come in and they're like, yeah, we're going to do this whole thing. We're going to, we're going to do this activity. We're going to find these goals. We're going to, we're going to do this faction mission. I'm like, okay, cool. So it's, so it's I kind of have an idea of where it's going to go, um, but I never actually know. Um, D&D actually gives me some anxiety. I have a late in life ADHD diagnosis and um running a game can be like anxiety inducing for me because it causes so much preparation going into it. Um, but then on the other side of it, because I never know what they're going to do and I'll like have stuff and everybody, everybody who's, who runs a game is like, oh yeah, I set up all these things and they went this way and like followed this duck for a while. And I'm just like, crap. Um, but fortunately, because like I'm uh, always like a million ideas at once, uh, I can improv pretty easily. So half the time they have no idea like what's in the game and what isn't in the game. Um, so that's good, uh, but it is a little anxiety inducing every time I do it. <laughs> so. uh, from Bryn again, do patrons on their own come into the library and use the gaming collection in house, say to play their own independent games? If so, what does the age range look like on that? Uh, no. So most of us, uh, most of the stuff that's happening at the library is they're coming in and they're checking it out. And sometimes we'll see a family play a game together if they're waiting for a kid. It's like getting a tutoring session. I've seen that happen this summer a lot. Um, but for the most part, they're checking out stuff to take to like home or on vacation or to like grandparents' house. Um, like I'm sure Jen, you see this too. Like once like we get towards the holidays, like your games just all of a sudden go whoosh out the door because people know they're going away and they have the time to spend on some of their, and you have a great strategy game collection. Ours is more like family games, party games. Cause what we're hearing from our, um, our patrons is they want more games for younger kids. So like we've been adding things like Haba and Peaceable Kingdom and just like easy party games to play. Um, and I've been trying to kind of like put some of those strategy games that we know are like big, big ticket ones, uh, like Ticket to Ride is super big in our library. Wingspan has been pretty popular, stuff like that. Um, so what we're hoping to do with uh, International Games Day this year is that I'm gonna have a Saturday intergenerational like morning where you can just drop in and play a game. Um, and then I'll have like an afternoon session that will probably be like D&D. &D. And then also um, we have like a miniatures group in Connecticut that you can hire to come run a miniatures game for you. Um, so I want to have that too. Oh, I'm so excited about that. I need to actually email them. Um, so try and do that. And so we can kind of get that in. And we've been trying to figure out a game night, but then also uh, I'm sure a lot of people are going through this. Like we are a little bit understaffed. Thanks pandemic. Um, so we're waiting kind of till we're fully staffed and we have like the mental bandwidth to like launch that too. So if that makes any sense. A uh, question from Mr. Maxwell asks, do you allow teens to run sessions in your library? If so, any advice on helping them become more competent DMs? Yeah, actually I do. Um, 
uh, when like my team volunteer that ran uh, our D&D for the summer in the afternoon this year actually called me last summer and was like, hello, um, can, how do I use a meeting room to run D&D at, at the library? Because my friends and I need like a central place and nobody can agree on a place to meet. And so we thought we could meet at the library. Can we get a meeting room? And they're actually too young to register for our meeting rooms. But I was like, hey, why don't you come to the teen room? There's a huge long table. Um, so this is how I befriended Colin and um, some of his friends. And um, he plays in my monthly game. He's running my game. So we try and facilitate that. So occasionally you'll see that. Um, I've actually had kids that are not playing in my ongoing game just because for whatever reason, um, cause like I never say no to letting a kid come into a game. And so the dynamic can change. Um, and so some of my kids that were more um, hardcore role-playing, like they want more of like a critical role type experience um, than like a mix of like combat and puzzles and whatnot. Um, they, decided they would split off and do their own. And so I see them sometimes and they're always like, hey, and they were they were funny because they were just like, are you mad at us for like not? I'm like, no, I think it's great. Like you're running, like Aaron had no idea what D&D was like a year ago. Uh, he started playing in my game. Now he's running D&D for his friends. Um, like, it's just, I try and make everything as accessible. Um, I sometimes will give tips, but not always. Um, just because sometimes teens don't want to hear criticism. Um, and they, even if I'm not really criticizing, they don't always, it just depends if I think the kid's open to it or I'm like, oh, here's what you can do. You can kind of do it like this. Um, I try and be like super um, laid back with that approach. Um, but yeah, but like when they were all like, oh, are, are, are you mad at us? I was like, no, because now my, my whole goal is to have more people playing RPGs in this town. And so you're, you're taking it off and you're doing it on your own. Like, I'm so excited. Like I, this is, it worked. <laughs> so that's, that's what happens. Um, uh, question, one page RPGs were mentioned. How does your library circulate those? Cool. So I haven't circulated them yet. My idea is to put them all in a binder and do a brief record for them um, and just kind of have them out there uh, just because and they're so easy to get a hold of. Like Grant Howitt has so many like great, terrible ideas. Like I want, like I really want to run um, Goat Crashers, which is you're a goat and you're crashing a party, but you can't have the humans figure out that you're a goat. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I want to run these games for the teens too, because I want them to know there's more than D&D. Um, so that's my idea. Have I gotten it off the ground? No, but we're getting closer to that idea coming to fruition. So I am constantly kicking a can down the road. That's the way most of us, I feel like, roll in library land, right? Or doing all that. Fair. I'm always amazed at your collection because you blow the rest of us out of the water, Jen. So Mary knows me personally, and she knows I'm a go big or go home kind of girl. Um, I just started entering in, pulling records in from OCL, say for like another 50 to 60 games. Um, but, you know, I completely agree with Mary on it. If you build it, they will come. And when people reach out to me, patrons, you know, the public, I'm like, just, just ask if you're... If you're a patron and you're asking, you're probably not the only patron who's thinking this thought, right? There's probably lots of people out there in your rural, rural small town example um, who want this and there's probably a huge need for it. So yeah, I totally believe it. And if, you know, if it doesn't work, then okay, it doesn't work. You try, maybe let it sit and linger a little bit and you can always revisit it in the, in the future. Um, yeah, and we've also put in, so we have a makerspace, and so a lot of times I'll print minis for our games, um, if I have the time and the bandwidth to, to remember to do it ahead of time, um, and so then we get kids that are like, oh wait, can I can I make my own minis and have them printed? I'm like, yeah, do you want me to train you on a 3D printer? So it's like a, right? And then one of the other things we're doing right now, I forgot to tell you about this, Jen, uh, I somebody created on Thingiverse a 3D version of Settlers of Catan, so we're printing that, and I'm going to do a community paint day where we all paint it, and then it will go in circulation. Uh, so jealous of you folks. Um, yeah, someone comments in, Molly comments, holy crap. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel too. We don't have a makerspace here or a 3D printer, um, so even when our, we have pieces that go missing and they're somewhat replaceable stuff, I can't duplicate them on a 3D printer. Um, we like patch stuff together sometimes. 
So jealous when I'm saying when we get a new library, Mary, I will contact you about that stuff. But well, know, let me know. Well, let me know if you need pieces printed. We can probably work something out, Jen. Fair, fair. Jen is quite fair. So we've had some amazing chat um, going on, folks talking about things that they like playing, things that they've shared that work for their library, um, companies to reach out, um, amazing resources in the chat too. So if you're watching this later on, definitely take a stroll through the chat. There's links um, and just a lot of great just comments back and forth. Um, really great stuff. Um, do we have final comments, questions, anything else folks would like to ask Mary? Um, the links are getting thrown in there again for today's Mary slides and for her handouts. Um, the links for events are also, um, they magically poofed and they were there. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Mary. Um, I have maybe one more question, one more question. Um, connecting to the earlier question about pitching a table talk collection in academia, lots of decision makers discount any collection items that doesn't directly serve a circular outcome. Any advice to convince those who will say no to anything that has its primary value in recreation, community, mental health, et cetera, but all direct course ties. Ah, yes, that's a magical question I feel like many people have when it comes, and not just in academia, in public libraries too. Yeah, I would say if you have like any type of, um, what's the right word? Again, I've been out of academia for like eight years now. Um, any type of department that's doing any type of work, whether it's like video game programming or any type of, um, oh gosh, what's the right word? You can also, I, I often have pitched D&D as like how to teach teens how to project, project manage. Um, as well as like work collaboratively with people, because I think we all know group projects in school don't actually teach people how to work collaboratively. It just teaches you how to hate other students because um, there's always one that never does anything. Um, and it's a good way of how to interact with people that you may have nothing in common with. Um, so there's there's that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, I would also see if like any of your departments, like because so many people are also now doing research on like, how does like like there's like what Jane McGonigal who writes books on neuroscience and gaming. Um, so there's a possibility that you could do something with a, like a department that's do this someone's interested in that that type of, of area and like oh hey what if we created this collection for you. Um, so there's that I would I would try and and I know it's like you can get some departments that are like you know faculty say they want something a lot of times then like people are like oh now we have to get it whether we want to or not so uh but this could be a benefit for you uh that's kind of how I would do it um I also would like I said try and, and reach out to some students that you know um there's probably gaming clubs at your college that you could be like hey how can we best support you um in like creating them and they usually need space too like that's i mean that's one of the big things for libraries right we always are a space for people that need it um for whatever they're trying to do whether it's co-working or job searching or uh, playing dnd yeah well, lots of great comments from folks and kind of riffing off what you're saying sharing their experiences um um a link to analog game studies org um which could be helpful for some folks but yes i yeah i like even our community college here in manchester um they have like a game studies program so if you're a bigger university you might have something like that already and if you reach out to those folks um even the english department like because there's reading skills and writing and developing um so again maybe if you build it they will come and maybe management will change in the meanwhile. That could happen too. Excellent. All right. Um, Mary, thank you so much um, for your time and your expertise on this. Mary's always my resource when I have a burning RPG question. So hopefully you learned something from her today. Um, thank you for our game RT friends who are behind the scene, um, helping with tech support and who helped get this up and going. And if you aren't a game RT member, and you are an ALA member, it's ridiculously cheap to join our round table. We've been doing a lot of fantastic stuff over the years. Um, so I highly encourage you to join us, one of us, one of us, one of us. 
Um, so that is all. Uh, we'll catch you next time for our next uh, webinar or learn, learn to play kind of situation. Um, and thank you again, Mary. Thank you for having me. I'm always hyped to share my expertise. And if anybody has questions, I have my email. So please reach out. Please do. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for your time today and your attention. And um, we'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.